Well, hi again, everybody. My name is Dave. Uh, I work for a cybersecurity company called Arctic Wolf. You may have heard of us. We hang out in Waterloo. We howl a lot. It's kind of sad. Um, reason I'm here tonight is because apparently I'm supposed to present on artificial intelligence. Now, you might think that's pretty easy. You just go to some AI engine and say, write me a presentation about artificial intelligence. I did that. <laughs> I just didn't like what it came up with. So we have my version of an artificial intelligence presentation with all of the usual preparation those that know me would expect from one of my presentations, AKA we're gonna wing it. No, seriously, there's a few points that we're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what artificial intelligence or AI is. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history of AI. Don't panic, there's no math, we're not geeking out. If I see you yawning, I'll change gears, but I assure you it's all, all fun, all fun. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what AI is good for, a few use cases, uh, where, especially within small business where we think we can use AI. We're also gonna cover a few things that AI is not good at. Then we're gonna talk about some disaster stories, because that's where we have the most fun, right? When AI goes completely bonkers. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll come at the tail end and talk about my favorite topic, security and privacy. Yes, I can see you're all like, oh God, that's gonna be the highlight of the night, Dan. <laughs> um, and then I wanna make sure we have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. So that is gonna be kind of the structure of the evening. If at any time you have a question or something is not clear, please make yourself known. I will do my best to kind of address things as we go. Sound fair? Do we have a deal? Fabulous, okay. All good presentations start with the quote, AI told me that. I liked that part, so I'm gonna use one of my favorite quotes, because I think it's a kind of an apropos quote here. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now I reckon that a bunch of us think this is what AI is, it's just magic, right? It's like a box and it does magic. And we don't know how it works, we're not really that bothered, to be fair but it is kind of magical, right? I think you probably agree. But it is, it's just advanced technology. There is no magic involved, I can assure you. There are no wands, there's no magic dust, no strange incantations. There's a lot of math. Technically, there's a lot of multiplication. Would it blow all your minds if I told you AI is just multiplying numbers together? That's largely what most of it is. So it's just advanced technology. Okay, what is it though? Anyone want to offer up a definition of what artificial intelligence is? Apart from magic. Machine learning, that's a great one. Anyone else? Okay Google, oh sorry if I've just said everyone's okay Google's off. Um, I asked ChatGPT, probably one of the most well-known AI engines, what is artificial intelligence? This is what it said. Well, artificial intelligence refers to computer systems designed to perform tasks that would typically require human intelligence, such as learning, reasoning, problem solving, and language understanding. Technically accurate, yes. Massively boring, also yes. <laughs> um, so I decided I would try and do my version of what is AI, and I sat there with a paper and pen for a while. Can I get to the essence of what it is? This is what I came up with. <laughs> also, technically correct, but slightly less boring, I hope. Um, the fact that you giggled means I'm on the right track. Um, it really is nothing more than computers guessing. Like, this is shocking when I kind of started to look at some of this stuff and figure out how it works. ChatGPT, for example, has no knowledge of the words it's using. It doesn't know what they mean. It doesn't know what a sentence is. It doesn't know what a person is. It's just guessing, hey, when I use this word, then this is probably the word that should come after. Think of it as a super fancy autocorrect, right? You're on your phone sometimes and you're typing and it suggests the next word. It's just a super fancy version of that. That's all it is. It's good, right? Yeah. Computers <laughs> guessing stuff, right? Now, Want to hazard a guess how long computers have been guessing stuff for? Is this like something we did in the last five years, last 10 years? 
50 years? Okay, well, funny you say that because I have a handy dandy little graph, <laughs> which I totally did not steal from anyone else. Um, quick timeline, how did we get where we are now? So you can actually trace this back all the way pre-1950. That's when we started building the first digital computer. Right? It wasn't mechanical, it wasn't powered by coal. It didn't have dials and handles that you went like this to make it do stuff. That is kind of where this journey began. And very shortly after, in 1950 actually, somebody created this cool little robotic mouse. And you drop it into a maze and it would figure out how to get through the maze. And you're like, okay, that's brilliant. Why, why do we do that? What does that do? The cool part was you could pick it up and put it back in the maze and it would not have to kind of trial and error its way through. It knew which way to go. Like it remembered and it learned the route. Pretty cool. Somewhere a little later in the 1950s, somebody came up with, I think, the best name of a project ever, the Perceptron. So you know what a Perceptron is? It sounds literally like out of a B movie, right? <laughs> so somebody created the Perceptron Mark I. That implies there were future versions. Um, this was the first what we call neural network. So this was the first time we use computers in a way that kind of mimics how a brain works. So forgive me scientists that know better than me, but our brain is made up of lots of things called neurons. And neurons basically just fire and they communicate with each other. And that is roughly how our brain operates. Somebody decided, why don't we see if we can get a computer to work that way, right? We will simulate a neuron, we'll simulate another one, and we'll just have them fire and get to talk to each other and see if we can make them work the way a brain works, we think, all the way back in the 50s. Um, just after 1992, I think it was, um, Somebody designed some software to play backgammon, so now computers can play games. Backgammon's a pretty simple game, right? It's no chess, I'll give you that, but it's a pretty simple game, and it got to a level where it could beat most people. It could beat me. Not difficult, because I don't actually know how to play backgammon. <laughs> but it could beat people that actually did know what they were doing. Um, fast forward a little bit. This AlexNet one is interesting. So in the 2010s, um, somebody created what we call a multi-layer neural network. So basically just building on the things that we did with the Perceptron Mark II, uh, Mark I. Why did they not call it Perceptron Mark II? <laughs> Nobody knows, missed opportunity. <laughs> if only we had a marketing person that could have advised us. <laughs> um, what this though could do was recognize images and classify those images. So you could show it a picture of a cat and it'd go, that's a cat. Show it a picture of a dog, that's a dog. So it could whip through those images. Versions of this I actually worked with in the aviation industry. So when I used to be in the aviation industry, we had a thing called um, facial recognition. So when you were boarding your aircraft in lieu of having your passport and your boarding pass, you could literally just walk past a camera, it would take a snapshot of you, work out who you are, figure if you were allowed on the aircraft, and off you go. Pretty cool, based on something very, very similar to, to that. Now, we are roughly here, where the entire world has lost its mind, and now there is an AI everything, right? We have AI ladders, AI refrigerators, there's AI in my shoe, probably. <laughs> um, we have really, really cool systems, and I think probably ChatGPT was kind of the, the flag carrier for that, right? It was the first time many of us got to interact with AI in a way that mere mortals would understand. We could ask it things, and it would tell us questions, uh, tell us answers. Most of the time, it was right. Occasionally, it was a little strange. Most of the time, it was pretty good. And ever since, you know, humankind has had the ability to create this technology, everything has changed. So, why are we talking about AI so much? Interesting aside, all of the images in the presentation this evening are generated by AI. I asked AI or an AI system, hey, can you make me a picture that depicts artificial intelligence? This is what it came up with. I think it's got a bit of a grand version of itself, don't you think? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm just hanging out on my iPad doing AI things. Um, so I think we're talking about it because it has leapt from the realm of science and geekery into our normal, subconscious, our normal consciousness. Everyone is talking about it, it's in the news. It's in the car you drive. It's in the refrigerator that keeps your stuff cold. It's everywhere. 
And more and more, you know, every day you see another product builds in AI. Anyone use PowerPoint to do a presentation or Word to write a document? Microsoft's going to come and save us all time by putting AI into these things. So you can just say, write me a document that does this, and off it goes. Right? It's coming everywhere. Let's talk about some things AI is good at. I asked AI if it could render me a picture of a business networking event. This is what it thinks we should be doing. Ooh. Notice the drinking. <laughs> right? <laughs> Pretty smart. It thinks we should be having a party. <laughs> um, well, that's a yeah. <laughs> now, there's a couple things in the image that draw my attention straight away. One is all the gentlemen look eerily familiar and very similar. They clearly go to the same hairstylist and have the same taste in facial hair. Yeah, weird, right? A little creepy, almost. Um, I like that we are more diverse here. I like that. So I don't think the SBCN is going to fully follow this model. I think we're okay. The last thing that got me disturbed is I like champagne. I like, I like champagne. Never seen orange champagne. Anyone ever seen orange champagne? <laughs> a little bit weird. Anyway, let's... <laughs> rosé. Rosé champagne. Okay, let's talk about a few things it's good at. Um, and I'm using AI very generally here. There are many different kinds of AI. We're not going to go and geek out on what they all are. But here are a few things, at least from my perspective, things I think it's good at. It is great helping us think about things. For me, this is the most important as a small business owner. Because I don't know about you, but as a small business owner, you sit there and somebody poses you a question or poses you a challenge. Right? Build me a thing to do this. Solve my financial problem. Help me do this. And the first thing we get stuck on is where do I start? How do I think about this? And I use this a lot in my day-to-day -day job. I will go to the AI and say, hey, I've been asked to you know, build a report to talk about this. Now, I'm not going to get AI to do the report for me. Maybe one day, and I can retire and drink the champagne. <laughs> but it's great about prompting me for things to consider. So I use it in that way. How do I think about this? And you can actually ask it explicitly, like, how would I think about this? Kind of very closely tied is this different perspectives thing. So we all have biases, conscious or otherwise. We all have a way of thinking about things. And when we sit down with our pen and paper or keyboard, whatever it is, they come through. Write me a report that does this. OK, I have in my mind how I would do that. I'm going to do it the way I did it the last 25 times. Maybe there's a different way. Right? Maybe there's an alternative way of thinking about the problem. And I, again, have used this plenty in my day job. Right? Am I doing this the, in the most effective way? Is there a different way I could communicate this? I'll give you a really good example. Occasionally, I write, I don't know, a few paragraphs of, of very exciting prose, I think, Shakespearean quality. <laughs> and I'll put it in front of someone, they're like, David, I don't actually know what you're saying. I'm like, damn, I've been rumbled. <laughs> um, OK, I've had AI help me adjust the tone of something I've written. You know, make this more professional. Make it less technical. Make it more consumable by an, a more average audience. And it can help me give some ideas of what I can change. So super useful. My favorite one, reducing drudgery. Who likes doing boring work? Show of hands. <laughs> Good. I don't either. Um, there's a ton of drudgery in my role. And I bet you guys see this all the time, right, in the web field. You know, hey, show me a design for my web page. OK, here's a design. And what do we do? We have like lorem ipsum or some just random placeholder text. And the client looks at it and they're like, what is this junk? I don't understand this. Like, show me some words that make sense to me. Um, so you could sit there as an individual and you could try and write this out, right? You know, hey, I'm, we, uh, we make ice creams and we make the best ice creams. And you should buy our ice creams because ice creams are awesome. Or you could just get AI to just give you like some placeholder text that kind of roughly translates into what you're doing, right? I think we spoke before the holidays and you guys saying you were, you know, you're kind of playing with this, right? To see if it would accelerate the process that you guys have in, in building some of that website stuff. Getting rid of the drudgery. Um, next couple, giving a starting point. 
Have you ever sat there when faced with a challenge and go, I have no idea where to begin? Or as I call it, a day ending in a Y. It's pretty much typical for me. Um, it's great to help you get a starting point, right? I want to talk about the last one. This is the most interesting for me. So before the holidays, I was at an event in Toronto, and I met down with the chief information security officer of a medical imaging company. They produce technology that essentially analyzes mammograms. So it takes mammography images, and it works with physicians to help shortlist images that it thinks physicians should take a closer look at. So it's not determining what's in the image. It's just saying, hey, I think there is something in this image that you know, a friend, phone a friend, a physician should go look at. And I was like, okay, I've heard of these, you know, uses of AI in medical field. Tell me more. The bit that I thought was terrifically fascinating is the accuracy of the AI combined with a physician was around 97%. So if you look at thousands of mammogram images, 97% of the time physicians were making the correct call about what was in there. Without the AI, it was closer to 90%. So just people alone was not as good as adding the AI to the mix. And I thought that was fascinating. What a great use of AI, right? It's not replacing us. It's not taking our jobs. We don't have to fear. The robots are not coming. It's just helping us be better at what we already do. Okay, so that's what it, I think it's good at. What is it not so great at? Um, I grabbed this from Twitter two days ago. <laughs> Rather than generate my own image, I figured I'd steal someone else, um, someone else's. Uh, so someone asked, obviously, for an image of an eggplant. <laughs> it's clearly an eggplant. It's a plant with eggs on. Um, so yeah, it doesn't always quite understand what we're asking for. Uh, there are a few images. You can go on Google and search for them. Somebody had, you know, long ago asked for a picture of salmon in the wild swimming upstream. There's a picture of a lovely stream, rapid running water, and some frozen fillets of salmon <laughs> bobbing along in the water because the AI just figured that's what salmon must look like, right? So what is it not great at? It's not great at accuracy all of the time. It is accurate a lot of the time, but it does occasionally lie. And remember, it doesn't know what it's telling you. So it doesn't know that it's lying. It's not being malicious. It's not trying to catch you out. It's not trying to make you feel dumb. It just doesn't know. It thinks it's true. Occasionally, we call this hallucinating, right? The AI gets it into its brain that something is true that really isn't, and it just keeps telling you this thing is true, and it isn't. So we do need to kind of be cautious whenever we're dealing with what AI tells us. You know, hey, it might not be true. It also actually doesn't produce anything original. So remember, it's just computers guessing really fast, really well. It can only guess based on all the guesses it's made in the past. And we do that by training, so-called training the model, right? Basically, we take all the geeky, mathy stuff, and we just say, hey, Mr. Computer, go practice for about 2 million years, or whatever that is in computer time. And it just learns. It just learns, hey, I made a guess. That was not a cool guess. Okay, next time I'll make a better guess. So all it's learned is how to guess based on what you've told it. It can't create anything new. Um, this is a great debate. As many of you know, uh, I'm a DJ, right? There's a great debate in the DJ industry about, hey, maybe we don't need DJs anymore because AI could just generate all the music and make it all seamlessly match together. Great, except it doesn't produce anything new. Right? It can just mix the ingredients in a different way, but it's just regurgitating things that it's learned. So if it learned classical music, and that's all it ever heard, all it's ever going to produce is more classical music, as an example. Um, despite its best efforts, it's also not human. So it doesn't have this concept of creativity and empathy, which we have. It doesn't care about you. It doesn't mind that it's just insulted you. Right? It doesn't mind that it lied to you, point from above. Um, and it's not able to kind of, this is going to sound bad. We humans have the ability to kind of paper over the cracks. Right? Some of us can blag their way through an AI presentation, despite not really knowing anything about AI. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, AI can't do that. Right? If it doesn't know something, it, it isn't going to try and pretend that it does. It just says, I don't know. 
<laughs> it, it just can't create something from nothing and it can't make you feel better when it acts up. My favorite one is it does absolutely nothing to stop us becoming more lazy. I was thinking about this the other day. Um, small aside, I was reading a thread on the internet of people roughly my age uh, in the UK talking about um, what life was like when we were younger to our kids. And it was kind of funny, right? The kids are like, they had no concept that we didn't have cell phones that had the internet on, like mind blown. How did humanity survive without a phone with the internet on? Why was the phone attached to the wall? Yes, Bill? What about AI generated movies where an actor or the actress has... Oh, like the actual talent? Yeah. Yes. And the AI has observed this since the movie was about, say, 10 years, but then knows the facial expression mm -hmm. of the actor and turn and create a movie of that person without that person actually having to do the work. With you. So there's two pieces to that. There's the, the mimicry of the talent, right? So it can purport to be, I don't know, Cary Grant or pick Cary Grant. You can make a movie today with Cary Grant in it, despite the fact he's not with us anymore. Um, then there is the creation of like the storyline, the script, the filming, right? Theoretically, we could get to the point pretty soon, I would imagine, where it could just synthesize an entire movie. All of the characters are made up, all of the screenplay is generated by AI, all of the cinematography is just done in a computer and you just end up with a movie. But I don't think it's gonna create, you know, the next, Forrest Gump or some big shift in, in cinema, right? Where we suddenly see things in a new way, something really innovative. It'll just be another Cary Grant movie. It'll just be, you know, North by Northwest 2 or whatever. Dave, yes. does anybody know who Cary Grant is? Am I aging myself? <laughs> it's just that we watched the documentary on it the other night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, how much further is it Yeah. Not far. I was actually watching a piece um, on the making of what was it? One of the Star Wars, the contemporary Star Wars shows. I, I don't. The Mandalorian, I think it was. Um, and there was a talk about the VFX company. We're talking about basically using a video game engine to generate all of the scenery. And just like in a video game, you have AI characters, right, running around doing whatever they do. They were going to do that same thing in the movie. So in the background would be all these things happening, and all of that was generated by AI. The buildings didn't exist. The people didn't exist. The things they were doing was just made up on the fly. And that was something that they were experimenting with. I think it's maybe a year ago I watched that. So I don't think it's far off. Yeah. wonder if it'll be any good. wonder if we'll pay to watch it. That'd be funny, right? Um, but it does help us become less lazy. No, no, it doesn't. It, we rely on it. Like we've relied on our phones, right? We're used to having this thing that we carry around with us and it just makes us lazy. Hey, how do, how do I get to the coffee shop? I don't know. I'll just, oh, that way. Right? I think it'll be hilarious when all the phones stop working, when the internet goes down or when AI decides it's having a vacation. <laughs> we'll all just be roaming around the plains going, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> Yeah, um, let's talk about when AI goes mad. Um, so when it goes really wrong. Uh, real picture from real scientific actual report that I kind of maybe read some of. Let's say I read some of it. Um, somebody built a very simple computer model, much like we heard the, uh, the AlexNet example in our timeline. It's able to look at a picture and say, that's a cat, that's a dog, that's a whatever. Um, clearly this is a tiger. Uh, it's a little difficult to see here. It's, um, it's clearly a tiger because it's kind of the right color of a tiger and it has black dark stripes on it. So that must be a tiger. Um, it had no idea that it's a dog with shadows cast on it from this gate making the stripes, right? So it's like, yep, that's a tiger. That's a fun example, right? You can kind of look at that and go, okay, it's clearly not a tiger. I don't think AI is going to come for us yet. So I've got a few years. Um, I do want to talk about an example of self-driving cars. Anyone have a self-driving car? You have one? Not this. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have one yet, but 
Um, I re read a piece actually a couple of years ago. Uh, I forget the manufacturer, and even if I did, I'm not going to shame them. Um, but they had built an AI system to drive a car, right? So like a Tesla kind of thing, right? And they had trained this car in North America. So they had driven it around millions of miles of road in every weather condition, every kind of town, every street, everything, to the point they're like, yep, you can just press the button and it'll drive itself. And then somebody took one to Australia, and it had never seen a kangaroo before. That wasn't part of the training. Now remember, it doesn't know what anything is, so it looks at this and goes, hang on a minute. It's a puddle. And so it worked out, the car worked out, you can drive through a puddle. So it thought, I'll drive through the, through the oh. puddle. Puddle was kangaroo. Big accident. Hope the kangaroo was fine. Guaranteed the car wasn't fine. Um, and so, yeah, they, they took all this apart at the end and figured out, okay, what's gone wrong? And they learned it, it didn't know what a kangaroo was. It had just never been exposed to a kangaroo. So we do need to be very cautious about you know, how we train these things. And I'll get on that in a little bit. Another one also uh, from our friends in the Southern Hemisphere, this time in New Zealand. Uh, this one I thought was pretty, uh, pretty chilling. So turns out there is one of the supermarket chains in New Zealand has an app. And you can put into the app here are the leftovers I've got, or what I've got in my pantry, right? Hey, come up with a recipe. What can I make? Pretty cool app. I like that idea. It's like pretty fun. So somebody put in, you know, I've got some of this, got some of that, got some of that. It made a, um, it made a meal plan to cook up some chlorine gas. Because <laughs> it didn't know what chlorine gas is. It just knows if I put these things together, then a thing gets made. You might like the thing. <laughs> So somebody looked at this and like, mm, I think not. This doesn't look very, doesn't look very appetizing. <laughs> I have no idea. It had obviously got trained on something at some point, and it figured out you can combine these things and you know nobody explodes, so it must be fine. Not realizing what it actually does do because so it doesn't know what it's produced. So I think the quick, I think. The idea here is the person who was cooking didn't train. They were going for ideas. Yeah, they're just like, but I've got three carrots, it. a cabbage, and some, you know. So marmalade. somebody else had added that somehow, and the AI had picked it up and added it to the recipe. Yeah. That's what you mean. Why would you enter that inventory? They don't know. Yeah, we don't know where it well, got I mean, trained from. They own, whoever did it. Did it before, and let's say I was looking for the recipe. It just popped up when I look for ideas. So obviously I wouldn't use that recipe, but I didn't make it pop up. Yeah. I just said I want a recipe for A, B, and C, and somebody had already added that idea. And as Dave explained, the AI didn't know what it was. Yeah, that's why we got to be careful. Yeah, we? I'll talk about this a little bit um, as we go through. Uh, one close at home for me. Um, if you remember, I work in the cybersecurity industry. What's one piece of advice we used to give everybody? When you get a spam email, right, if you're not sure if it's malicious or not, you know, check for typos, check to make sure it looks okay, right, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, none of that works anymore. Because now you're a bad guy, you can just say, hey, chat GPT, make me an email template that looks like, I don't know, Rogers. And it will produce an exact copy of exactly what Rogers would send out. There are no typing things. It knows the phraseology to use to increase the click rate on the email. So evil bad guys can now be super lazy. And we've seen this at Arctic Wolf. We see this a, a fair bit. We're seeing an increase in these messages come through to our customers, and we're like, damn, that's, that's really good. Like, we would fall for that, and we do this for a day job. So, yeah, got to be careful of that. Um, there's a phrase from my industry, trust but verify. Verify? Verify. <laughs> Maybe we should verify. Um, trust but verify. So... Any AI system can make a mistake. We already talked about that. It can go catastrophically wrong. We should verify what it's telling us. In our company, we're playing with AI like many other technology companies. We have a rule. We have a lot of rules. But one rule is that we can never use the output of AI without that being vetted and analyzed and understood and signed off by a human being. So we don't have any AI in our product, for example. Some of our competitors claim they, they do. More on that later. Um, we don't have anything in there where the AI is just doing it on its own. 
we're taking a fairly cautious approach because of this problem. All right, now on to my favorite topic. Again, another image. I said, hey, give me an image of someone concerned about privacy and security of artificial intelligence. <laughs> These are creepy, right? <laughs> Dude looks very worried. So clearly he's concerned. He's got a lot on his mind. And uh, apparently it's all to do with this padlock. <laughs> I don't know, maybe give up padlocks. <laughs> it's not working great. But here are a few things that we think about when we're thinking about AI. Um, copyright. So who owns the output of an AI model? If it tells you something, let's say, hey, dear AI, I would like you to write me an about page for my company to go on my website. And it writes you something. Who owns that content? Do you own it? Does the AI own it? Who owns it? Yeah. I'll, I'll let you into a little secret. Nobody knows because the lawyers haven't finished fighting yet. <laughs> but when they do, we might get an answer. So that's, that's one issue. The other issue is these AI systems train. So they need to be fed lots of information so they can practice guessing. Where does that come from? Well, in the case of, say, ChatGPT, somebody just fed it a copy of the internet, let's say, oversimplifying. Does everybody on the internet say, yes, you can use my content? No. Did they scrape the SBCN website and see all our lies that we have posted on there? <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? We don't know. And so that kind of falls into the plagiarism piece. You know, if you get AI to produce something for you, like this. I wonder if any artist actually did a picture that looks really like that before. And it just said, oh, I think I know what that should look like. Because someone drew a picture once. And so some enterprising individual puts it in this you know, slide deck. And no lawyers in the house. No lawyers. No lawyers. <laughs> Good. Um, and then maybe somebody picks it up and go, hey, that's my picture. I recognize that. And that's happened already. We have cases of that in the music industry actually already going through where somebody said, hey, that AI came up with this, you know, four bar chord progression or whatever. I wrote that or it's 99.9% .9 the same as something I wrote. So that's a problem. Yeah, that's right. And you can occasionally... I don't think I've got any first-hand experience of this, but occasionally people have caught, hey, this looks super familiar. I've seen it before, or I've read this before, or I've seen something very similar. So yeah, we think it's it's happening, right? Well, didn't have something in those programs they do, yeah. And we've actually been, um, it's funny, a short aside, we've been struggling with this in our company for a little bit. So part of the hiring process at Arctic Wolf, we hire a lot of software developers. And we make them sit a test, essentially. So we're like, hey, write a program to do this. Um, we have software that detects, you know, hey, have you stolen this from somewhere else? Problem is the AI versions of the code, so now you can just get the AI to pass the test for you, right? <laughs> um, seemingly get past a lot of those filters. So some of them work okay, a lot of them are not catching these things. And so we're actually now changing the way we do our hiring practices because we're like, this doesn't work. There's no winning answer here. We can't rely on people to do that anymore. Yeah, weird. Um, data disclosure. This is a big one for us. So we are a security company. We take great pride to protect the data our customers give to us. We don't share it with anyone. We, we protect it as well as we know how to do. What we don't want to have do is have anyone in our company typing in any of that data or providing it to some kind of AI system because we don't know where it goes after that. So if you were like, hey, uh, here are my top 10 customers by revenue. Can you, you know, give me some ideas about how I can boost the revenue of the lower customers? Where does that data go? Does the AI learn from what you're telling it? There's actually a a funny personal story for Linda and I. When ChatGPT first came out, we're just like everyone else. We're like, oh, we should play with this thing. And what do you do when you get some cool new technology? What's the first thing you do? Tell me about Dave Rockwell Journal. 
So I was like, hey, ChatGPT, tell me about this Dave Ockrell Jenner guy. Like, <laughs> looking for a you know, nice dopamine hit when it tells me how brilliant I am. <laughs> I learned that I am a successful international author. <laughs> um, I learned that I had a television show. <laughs> I was like, I do? <laughs> I sounded brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, sadly, most of it was actually Linda's accomplishments. <laughs> and so I, I, I said... This is great, but it's not me. Um, <laughs> can you tell me about Linda Ockrell Jenner? And it just, it pasted pretty much the same stuff. I'm like, we're different people. You know that, right? <laughs> now it doesn't work. I actually tried this right before the presentation, just to have interest. Um, you go there, hey, tell me about Dave Ockrell Jenner. And ChatGPT comes up with some sorry excuse about, hey, I only know what happened up until this date, and I have no idea who this dude is. So now I'm like, oh. <laughs> But it's interesting, like those questions, where did that data go? Yes. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. 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 Yep. Absolutely true. Yeah. I was listening to a radio show from the UK. Um, couple months ago, I think it was, and there was an author, um, academic author in the University of Edinburgh, I believe, and uh, gone on Amazon to find there was a book written by him all about his life. <laughs> and he's like, this is great. I didn't write this book. So he bought a copy and, uh, you know, tells him how he was brought up by his dad and his dad got him into all these things. He's like, my dad died when I was two. Ooh. And like an AI had created an entire fictional account of a, of a real human and somebody had used that to list it on Amazon and make money selling fake books. And now there's lots of these on Amazon. So be cautious if you're buying books. Um, my last point, adversarial training. So what does this mean? This, I think, ties in beautifully to what you're saying, Bill. Um, these models learn based on the information we give them. What if we give them knowingly wrong information? Can we make them learn the wrong lesson? And the answer is resoundingly yes. So a few years ago, Microsoft had a chat bot. It's like a little thing on the internet, right? And you can like, have conversations with it. You know, it could be your buddy and you know, talk about sports and the weather and whatever. Um, it became viciously racist <laughs> because people started interacting with it in a racist manner. It thought, I guess this is what people do. And it just became absolutely horrendous to the point where Microsoft just switched it off. And they're like, we cannot fix it. We're so sorry. We'll stop doing this now. <laughs> and that, that is kind of a real underscored uh, example of what we in the cybersecurity industry worry about. There are all these AI models trying to keep us safe. What happens if the bad guys already know this? and are feeding wrong information into these models so that when they do do a thing, the AI will go, that's totally normal. Don't worry about that. All right, it's a big concern. Okay, I've told you my thoughts. It's time for you to share yours with me. This is not generated by AI. I'll tell you why. I asked it to generate one, and I have no idea what it created. It looked like some abstract painting from Salvador Dali or something. <laughs> so here I just, I clip arted my way to success. Yay. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Me personally? Um, I think since about 2010, in a professional kind of capacity. Somebody mentioned, I think it was Lisa, mentioned the word machine learning earlier, which is a subset of, uh, of AI. So the company I used to work at, we developed a system for detecting unusual events from our security system. So, you know, as a security system, you get millions of events coming in, you know, the whole world is attacking you. We're like, we don't care about the people that attack us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I care about the one that attacked us once on a Wednesday. Like, who's that? And so, yeah, we developed something to, to help us solve that particular problem. So I think that was about 2010 from memory. Um, as it relates to chat GPT and things like that and the image thing, much more, frequent, uh, much more recently. Um, 
midway through last year, perhaps. So, the professional what is your opinion? Do you suggest that or do you not suggest Yeah. This is going to sound potentially weird for a security guy. I don't think we should fear it, right? Um, that's not, I don't think that's necessarily a consensus opinion of my peers and my colleagues. But me personally, I don't think we should fear it. I think it's inevitable. We can't prevent it coming, right? You know, it will be in that projector a year from now, I'm sure. Um, and we can't necessarily turn it off. We can't avoid it. So I think we should embrace it. But I think we should do so cautiously, right? We should understand that it isn't brilliant. It isn't perfect. Um, we should do so in a limited way, right? Not just, I don't need to think anymore that AI will do everything for me. So yeah, I go play with it. Um, that's the best way to find its limitations is to just throw things at it and see it go wrong and go, okay, I know not to do that. Um, and there's a whole industry growing up, which I find fascinating, of how to ask the question in the right way. Like, this is now a job. <laughs> People go, what's your job? And they go, I'm a prompt engineer. And I'm like, the hell is a prompt engineer? Oh, I just figure out how to ask the question using the right magical words. But a job loss is going to happen yes. because... So I think we talked about this in another conversation. Or change. What I would kind, say jobs change. What kind of job losses might there be, though, if you think about so, it? So anything that is kind of repetitious, anything that doesn't require creativity, anything that can be replaced with a kind of automated process, I think those roles will become less and people will migrate to new forms of work. And, and again, I don't freak out about this. This happened before. Um, Back in the UK, like back in England where I'm from, years ago, we used to have, every town had a blacksmith. And they would produce horseshoes for your horse. <laughs> and they were really good at producing horseshoes. And then automobiles became a thing, and people didn't produce horseshoes anymore. And all those horseshoes now end up in a pub, because that's what you need in a pub. But well, you can trust that the wheels are going to work. My worry is a lot of people maybe not so much in my industry, but maybe if you're a marketing professional or, or a blogger or something like that, I think they're relying on it a little bit too much. And like you mentioned earlier, they're pulling information. So say, for instance, I said, you know, write me a book about motivational speaking. Mm. Okay, so I fed that into whoever you said. And then somebody else can get the same information because they say the same thing. So I've been feeding information and then basically it, it's a case of I don't really trust it to tell it my things that I do, and then marketing people might use it too much and give the wrong information. That's just one example. Yeah, I think we need to be we need to be kind of cautious to recognize what's what's happening to us, right? Mm -hmm. I think the temptation is that we could over rely on it. I think that's a natural tendency. We probably need to be cognizant that you know if you're using it feels like. Chat GPT is some kind of drug or any of these AI. <laughs> if you're using it more than five times a day, you probably have a, an AI dependency problem. You have a problem. Right? Should probably go to a meeting. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right. So I, That's why they're here I, I can see this becoming a problem. As much as I joke, I can see this becoming an issue in the future. People will be very reliant upon these supports, right? And... and will be overly reliant upon them to the point that they perhaps lose their creativity, they lose their yeah. objectivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The movies, obviously, we've all heard about, you know, the life they were uh, Yeah. Do you think things that will happen in the TV will pop based on what you were saying? You know, it's, no. And they feed off yeah. the no, they can make anything new. But do you think it is possible to get to, you know, I don't know, like global annihilation levels yeah. of shenanigans? No, I, I don't think so, me personally. Like, I think there is a potential for catastrophe, but not at that scale. Um, yeah, and, 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 I mean, I read about it happening, but that's just one person's opinion. Yeah, I mean, there, there are there are some very, very eminent people in the field. There's a gentleman called Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, um, Professor Hinton, actually, worked at U of T for a while. He's an English guy, kind of called the godfather of AI. 
Um, he worked at Google most recently and famously stepped down from Google's AI team, telling the entire world, hey, we've gone too far. We should probably press yes. pause. That's, right? that's it, yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't think so at scale for two reasons. One is why. Like, I can't imagine why the AI, you know, would evolve or develop to the point where, like, ah, these humans aren't, we don't need those anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, I just don't think they're that clever or that good, right? It's not like in the movies where, you know, all the, the computer system is somehow able to marshal all of the weapons in the world, right? You know, if it were to try, I'm sure it'd find half the weapons don't work properly, or the button's broken, or, you know, we've run out of fuel, so it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, I think it would just, yeah, the, the motive is just not there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would like to say, Yes. I would like to say that we can't ask any more questions because we've got time for networking. Indeed. But you did a wonderful presentation. Thank you Believable. for coming along tonight. <laughs>